can be posed for him. Uh, John, you've been addressing some of these questions in the chat pod, and I thank you for that, but I'm going to ask them again. Sure. Uh, uh, first off, uh, you mentioned the 90% capture rate for uh, particulate matter or dust. Uh, uh, is there a size associated with that? Well, it, to, to, to go back to what I showed, it's, it's, it's really so you look at research that quantified um, the size of particulates that are generally part of uh, odor emissions. And 90% of those, that, of that size, also happens to be in the same size range that trees are really adept at, at, inter, at, at holding on to once, once uh, if it's intercepting a particular particulate. And so the range is, is 5 to 3 microns. Um, larger particles tend to, to if, if, they're, if they're still small enough to be in the airstream, but larger than five, they tend to bounce around more and, and not be held onto um, tree surfaces. And then those that are lower than, than two microns, um, it's hard to measure for one thing. Uh, and two, they, they gets kinda, it, it, it gets very complicated. So there could well be um, particulates at, at the less than two micron size that are part of these um, that are being intercepted and held. But it's generally in that five to, to, to three. Okay. Uh, Rick, uh, I, I guess I would like to add to that. Uh, research has shown that anything over 10 microns really never travels more than five feet from a ventilation fan. Yeah, yeah. And, and then John is correct, you know, in that uh, three to five micron and, and up to eight micron is, is the uh, transition zone. And then it, it really becomes difficult to predict what's going to happen to something smaller than two and a half microns. Yeah. Relative to, uh, this is for either one of you, relative to particulate matter coming from livestock buildings, and, and maybe you want to tie this directly to uh, pork facilities, uh, what do we know about particulate matter and uh, transportation of pathogens, bioaerosols, viruses, that sort of stuff? What's the state of knowledge? I'll let you take that one, Dick. Well, um, <laughs> I could talk about biofilters a lot easier than trees and, and reduction, but uh, uh, let's see if we can make an analogy. We just completed a uh, research project on using biofiltration and PERS virus transmission, airborne transmission. And we found that uh, the, the biofilter was very effective in reducing the PERS virus. Uh, we're continuing that research and now looking at other microplasma type uh, viruses and see what happens to that. If we translate that into uh, trees and, and, and uh, shelter belts, um, I think there is some benefit, but uh, the porosity on a, on a shelter belt is, is uh, you know, much greater and the air passes through without coming in contact. And so uh, I think what would the, we'd have to do is do a lot more research. I don't know of any research that's really looked at or investigated that. No, I'm not aware of any either. Okay. Um, for my context, I think it's pretty young. Uh, going back, and, and you responded to this one, John, um, but in terms of, of citing a VEB, what, can you summarize your comments on distance between the source and the VEB? Yeah, and so there's there's a couple things going on. Is Well, there's a few, there's more than a couple things. The, there's always... There's snow that you have to deal with if you're in a part of the country that has snow. Um, there is ventilation issues, and then there's also the health of the trees. And so um, it it depends. And if if there's a snow issue, if you know, thinking of Iowa, where our winds come from the north, and and that's where most of the snow is blowing across the landscape. If there's a road to the you know to the north of the building, if there's uh, anything that you don't want a huge snow dump on, then that's going to determine where the trees go, and you're going to have a snow fence perspective on that distance. If that's less of a concern, then you got to start thinking about what kind of ventilation do you have. So if it's if it's a mechanically ventilated system, and we don't have a whole lot of evidence on this in the field, but what what I'm basing this on are um, 
uh, wind tunnel and sort of very controlled systems where they look at, at different kinds of fan systems and at what point in time does a barrier cause back pressure. And um, looking at some of the engineering literature, I generally put um, this idea that you can put a fence or you know some kind of a wall within five to six times the diameter of of the fan before you're going to create some of that back pressure. Um, so conceivably, you could put trees in that in that range. Um, of course, trees. Um, uh, they get larger as they grow, so you know you have to take that into consideration. But then, from the tree's perspective, you know, thinking of vent, uh, a mechanical system, um, that might just be too close for the trees. They, they're going to desiccate. Uh, they're going to transpire more water than is there because of of constant blowing or or periodic constant blowing and so on. And so. Um, we have a general rule of thumb of anywhere between 30 and 40 feet uh, seems to be a pretty good distance um, where you're still getting some, some effects of ventilated wind being pushed into the trees and the trees being at a distance where they're not going to be, um, at least that first row is going to have too much pressure put on them uh, physically. Thank you. Uh, there's a question come to both of you about uh, number of rows uh, that, of trees that should be used or, or of vegetation. Uh, and John, you you addressed the question already, but it, in terms of optimum number of rows and density yeah. uh, in writing, if you could do that again. And then Dick, uh, if you could chime in in terms of specific results of your study in terms of cost analysis between the one and three rows. Well, I, so it's a it's an excellent question, and I don't have a whole lot of information that really says anything definitively. And so um, I look to some of the wind tunnel work that we've done, where we're looking at um, uh, mixing of air streams above a simulated shelter belt or VEB system, and um, one row creates a. A, a pattern of wind dynamics. Two rows create a, you know, a, an enhanced dynamic um, in terms of getting some more mixing from two, from a lower airstream into a, an, into an upper airstream. And three seems to have um, yet another little bit of a push. Four didn't add anything to it, but you know, the the difference between the third row and the second row was so pretty minimal and and you know so there's different configurations there's different angles of the wind that you have to look at um, the the shape and height of individual tree rows plays a role um, so you know we we try to push as many trees as possible but most of our farm systems especially in the retrofits are, are land limited and in some cases the best you can get is a nice single row um, at best, we try to get them to do two rows so that you're getting some, uh, one, you're getting a diversity of, of individual trees out there. We also, even though my the systems I showed as an example only had three species there, we also try to get a, a mix of different species in there and more rows can allow for, for more species. Um, you know, so from that perspective, uh, wind dynamic perspective, Two to three um, is, is you're not gaining anything with a fourth just based on what little research we've done. From a filtration perspective, if you can maintain that 50% porosity or somewhere around there while you're getting a encouraging an, an inflow of of particulate laden air through these trees, you know more surface area um, intuitively makes you know is going to make an improved uh, area to intercept and and to hold on to dust. So you know three rows is better than two. But the more rows you get in there and the more trees, the, the, the inherent, the porosity of that whole matrix goes down and the, the, it becomes more like a wall and you're going to get more air being pushed up and over the shelter belt as opposed to through the trees. So again, it's, it's a really complex thing. Dick can probably answer more of that because of his field work. But um, again, I'm just basing it on, on, on what we do know. As far as your question, Rick, is uh, the cost for in our project, whether it be one row or two row or three row, uh, is, is it not a valid because we we spaded in mature trees. You know, we just couldn't afford to wait 20 years to do our research. So uh, we we wanted to get it done in uh, in less than two years. So we used uh, you know 
mostly mature tree that uh, had a chance of living as, as we progress through there. But if you look at the data that uh, the difference between one row and two rows and no rows, uh, there was a substantial reduction right beyond the shelter belt from going from no trees to one row of trees, even though that that one tree, row of tree only had about 84 per, uh, still had 84 percent forest. And then uh, I didn't show the data for two rows, but by the time you got to three rows, we were uh, significantly reduced down to uh, essentially no difference beyond the trees as well as uh, considerably away from the trees. So John is, is uh, right on when he says when you get up to three rows and beyond that, you, you really don't get, uh, get the effectiveness. And if I recall my data from two rows of trees, uh, it's not much different than three rows. And so uh, it would uh, kind of uh, substantiate what, what John has been saying. Uh, John or, or Dick, if you have something to add to this one, uh, I think there's a fair number of questions about uh, designing the, the landscape and the, the VEB. Uh, where would you recommend uh, people go, uh, whether they're from NRCS or, or private industry or wherever, uh, to get some information um, on starting one of these and laying one out? Well, here there is there's a couple of nurseries that I, I um, have gone to have sort of followed this idea and have gone to the workshops and all those sorts of things and have really sort of um, educated themselves on my perspective on their use and so on and so um, I don't necessarily endorse anybody but I, you know I, I do tend to give that those those names of, of individuals I know who who would definitely have some of these engineering concepts in mind when they're giving species advice when they're giving maybe even some design advice we also have a lot of private um, sort of forestry consultants, uh, field consultants that do tree planting and site prep and all of these kinds of things. And so um, there's a few of those folks that also have gone to these conferences and workshops and, and educated themselves. So um, you mentioned those workshops. So is that something that's ongoing or are those in the past? Those are in the past, yeah. It's through ISU Extension. We've done some air quality conferences um, in the not too distant past and, and so on. And we've got a little bit of extension information uh, here and there. Much of our stuff is been, un fortunately and unfortunately into the academic literature and so it doesn't really reach um, extension agents, field agents um, very often. But um, we're working on those kinds of things. There's a few websites out there that give uh, some, some perspectives on that as well. But it, it, it just comes to that. Well, I don't give direct, direct advice. I always defer to professionals in the field, nursery people and, and private consultants, because they're the ones that are going to go out and, and do soil testing and, and these sorts of things if they think it's necessary to determine um, the best site prep approach and, and so on. Much of the uh, answers for uh, producers should be try to be obtained as locally as possible because I know in uh, South Dakota here we have a difference between what we call East River and West River. The eastern part of the state is much more humid. We have a lot more rainfall versus out west, which is more arid. And so our recommendation for each of those locations would be different on the type of species and how the you know we would put them in. And I know our uh, our uh, forester here, Dr. John Ball in South Dakota, would uh, certainly uh, concur with that, and uh, and he has a, a lot of recommendations for the people in South Dakota. So I would encourage uh, producers to contact their specific states. I, I totally agree, and and I I often some people can think they can get good deals on buying tree stock online and these kinds of things. Um, Approaching this from a local perspective will make sure that you're going to get the right cultivars and, and those sorts of things, regional specific species and so on. So I totally agree. And that makes it hard to give specific recommendations about spacing and, and uh, uh, species and all yep. that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm not seeing uh, uh, new questions come in. If anybody wants to post a question, please do so uh, real soon. Uh, uh, Dick, John, do you have any final comments from your end? Well, Rick, there is one question here that I'm seeing. Um, what is the optimum distance between the first and the second row 
So this is sort of the distance between tree rows um, as opposed to the distance of the first row from a building or something like that. Um, we generally, uh, it, it depends on what kind of degree of porosity you want to maintain in, in the tree rows, but usually it's, it's determined by the kind of mowing equipment that they have. Um, if it's a riding mower, it's got to be <laughs> at least as wide as that. Um, and if these are trees that tend to, to go wide in the way that they grow, um, we take that into consideration as well if they're an area people want to walk through and so on. Um, so that's really dependent on available land, available equipment. There really is no, from my perspective, no, no general.